sometimes identify Christianity as one of the world's great religions. If you made a list of the most practiced religions in the world, Christianity would be on your list. Still, we know that the difference among these religions is significant. Is it correct to categorize Christianity as a religion? We'll address these questions and others on this podcast edition of Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rather with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Good day, Aaron. Thanks for leading us today on this edition of Craving Answers, Craving God. Absolutely, Chuck. Let's begin with this question. Can you start our conversation by giving us a good working definition of the term religion? Yeah, so um, religion is a, it's a body of belief. I'm trying to, this is the way people normally think of it. It's an ancient word, of course. People, nobody, scholars don't really know exactly what the original meaning was, but it, it's come to mean a body of belief specifically it's come to mean a body of belief as it's practiced. So you know, so the sense of like moral consciousness or a belief in the divine, but especially now, especially now in our culture, we've come to use the word religion to mean the way people practice their beliefs in the supernatural or practice out their moral consciousness. What do you think about the average uh, person moving around in the world today? Do you think that they equate the term Christianity and the term religion? Yeah, for sure. I mean, people think of Christianity as one of the religions. It's, um, you know, it's got a belief in the divine. It's got certainly a, a moral consciousness. It also has a set of practices and uh, um, uh, worship services and ethical obligations and those sorts of things that all the other religions um, have those similar things too. So, yeah, I mean, it's in, in, in that sense, it's fair to talk about Christianity as a religion. It's in, in some ways on the surface, it looks a lot like other religions. Okay. So, Christianity is a religion, Islam is a religion, Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism, all religions. Yeah. Are we done? We have a short program today. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know if this is where you're headed with that question, but um, other people have religions as well. There's a, there's a broader sense that you can define religion. Now I'm straying away from our culture's definition, as 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 is evidenced by a lot of people who describe themselves as, uh, you know, they they believe in a deity. They're spiritual, but they're not religious. These are the so-called nuns, and so in that definition, religion the so-called nuns. Yeah, the people who are define themselves as not atheist or agnostic. They're in some sense spiritual. They believe in a higher power. They have an internal life of maybe they meditate or they pray. Is that N O N E S? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So very technical term, right? Yeah, they don't they don't have I thought a religion. You're talking about the sisters uh, down the road here at our our. Uh... No, they're probably on the other end of the religious <laughs> spectrum, right? Okay. So the the nuns are those who are aren't outwardly practicing. They don't. They usually uh, a lot of them don't care for the the excesses and abuses of uh, you know official church life or official mosque life that uh, leaders in the religions have been uh, oppressive. Religions themselves are oppressive, so they embrace a sort of a, a generic spirituality or maybe even a sort of spe a, a specific spirituality, but not in the confines of religion. However, if you define religion uh, more broadly as to say, you know, a set of practices that flow out of one's basic commitments, then it's a lot more than just Christianity and, and Hinduism and Juda Judaism and Islam, et cetera. It's every single person has practices that flow out of their basic life commitments. And so it's uh, re religion is, you can't escape it. You, there, there's certain things that each one of us believes or don't believe, and that affects the way we act and the way we live our lives. And in that sense, all humans are religious. I'm not sure if that's where you were going with that, but. Well, it. I think is viewed in the minds of many, if not most of our listeners, that we attach the definition of the term religion to Christianity, and there's really not much more to talk about. If there is more to talk about, there must be some distinctions that need to be made. And yeah, 
is that important? Is that important to this discussion? Uh, if so, where do we start? Oh yeah, that's yeah. Okay, I see where you're going with that. Yeah, that's super important. I, <clears throat> I had a this happens to me at my the community college where I teach comparative religions quite frequently. I had a young guy come up to me uh, at a class uh, last semester, two semesters ago, and he said to me, he was like, I- "I'm not a religious person. I don't even really know if I believe in God." He said to me, "But but I think that religion is important." And I'm going to teach my kids to be religious when I have kids uh, because we need ethical guidelines in our lives. And I talked to him for a few minutes, but basically what it came down to is that he sees religions as essentially ethical teachings. And he looks around at all the different religions, you know, Christianity, Hinduism, even non-religious people, and he says, okay, here, are, they all share certain sort of things in common. You know, they all believe that murder is wrong. Um, they all believe that stealing is wrong. They all believe that lying is wrong. And the conclusion that he came to is that these religions are all basically doing the same thing. Um, and just, you know, they show up in different ways in different places. Maybe in the United States, there's more Christianity than there is Hinduism. But in India, there's way more Hinduism than Christian. But they're basically doing the same thing. What he had done is boiled religion down to ethical behavior, and the da- you know the, the danger of that, of course, is that or, or the danger might be the wrong word. The mistake in that is that all these religions themselves would reject that. Hindus, a serious Hindu, would never say, "Oh yeah, there's no difference between me." And and Christians, you know, we we all believe the same thing. We all do the same thing. A serious agnostic who also believes that murder is wrong and stealing is wrong would never say, oh, yeah, there's no difference between what I believe. So there must be something more to these religions. And it's worthwhile if there is something more to these religions than just their outward observances and their ethical uh, restrictions that they put on their members if there's something more to it, it's worth asking. And we're, we haven't really got to that yet, what the difference is. And I can feel you uh, pushing us in that direction. Uh, but it's worth asking what makes what makes Christianity, it, so you and I are both Christians, what makes Christianity different than all the other world religions and worldviews? So it's. I feel like we're about to go into another room. If religions share the goal of some kind of ethical behavior— some kind of understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. They all have that in common, and I, and I, I trust you when you say that they do. You said there must be something more. Right. Can you identify, do you want to go in the direction of Christianity here, or do you want to speak in general terms among the various world religions? What is it that is more? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Obviously, I'm a Christian. I can only talk about this in terms of I can only talk about this from my own viewpoint in terms of Christianity. And the the more is, what's the answer to the question, why should you not steal? So all religions, you know, and honestly, all humans everywhere believe that stealing is wrong. C.S. Lewis makes this point early on in Mere Christianity, that every single human being knows that stealing is wrong. Now, uh, some people have stolen so much that their conscience no longer bothers them. But if somebody steals from them, they're certainly very angry. Their conscience flares up then. They're certainly very angry. But the question is, why do you think that stealing is wrong? And for Christianity, the answer is radically different than all other religions. And all other religions, I think this is safe to say, and I'm not. Uh, if somebody out there is listening and feels like I'm talking out of turn, you know, please reach out to me and let me know. I think it's safe to say that in all religions in the world, the things that you do are done as a sign of devotion to the deity of that religion or to the guiding principle of the worldview that you belong to if you're not, if you don't believe in God, if you're not, you know, you don't have any sort of supernatural content to what you believe. There still is a guiding principle. And so the things that you do for instance, not stealing, are done to serve that guiding principle or done to serve that God. Um, So in Hinduism, there's a dharma that you have to do. There's uh, uh, rules that you have to follow, a life path that you have to do if you want to gain good karma for yourself. You know, the point of not stealing is to build up good karma and avoid the bad karma. 
In Islam, for instance, uh, you don't steal because Allah commands it. Allah demands submission. And um, it's offensive to him if you do steal. Um, if you, Say you're just your, your average, um, say you're, you're, you're not a religious person. Say that you're an agnostic or an atheist or a nun. Uh, why do you not steal? I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm sure but you, know, you want to be a good neighbor. There's, there, there's laws of civilization that you have to subscribe to. You must refrain from stealing. If you don't, you will end up in prison. This is a reason why you, you don't steal. For Christianity, though, um, it's different. You don't steal in Christian. So Christianity is built not around ethical demands as a way to appease or to make contact with or to avoid the anger of a deity. In Christianity, ethical commands flow out of a prior relationship. I don't have to I don't have to appease I don't have to appease God with my behavior. God's already appeased himself with his own behavior. I don't have to sacrifice to get the God to like me. In Christianity, our God has already sacrificed himself in order to love me and so that I can love him too. I'm thinking of that, uh, that student you were talking about before who's not sure he even believes in God, but he thinks that religion is a good thing somehow. If he were sitting here now and heard what you just said, would, would he be able to, I'm um, typically now, would he be able to process that or would that be so abstract that you just sort of left him in the dust? Oh, I think I'd probably have to do a way better job of explaining it than I just did. I, I'd have to give him examples to talk about what that would look like. Uh, you know, one example is, um, you, you know, t t take your, the, 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 and I'm talking to, for, for those of you who have or have had bad relationships with your parents, sometimes this is a touchy subject. But for those of you who've had good parents, think about your relationship with your parents. I, you know, we have, house rules in my house, like almost all houses have, you know, house rules. Here's the way we're going to behave. We're going to talk to each other this way. We're not going to steal each other's stuff. Many religions say, here are the rules. If you want to come into this house and be a member of this family, you have to keep these rules. Christianity, though, the relationship is prior. You're already a member of the family. My son is already a member of my family. He does not have to keep the rules of the house in order to be my son. He's already my son. If he violates the house rules, he's still my son. He doesn't go out and sleep in the driveway at night. Whereas for all their religions, you are in danger. of If you do not obey the rules, you are in danger of forfeiting your status. And I'm, I'm talking about you know, uh, supernaturally based religions, the, the, you know, the kinds that we've mentioned before are also uh, secular religions, the religion of the American dream or the religion of the sexual revolution. We've talked about these before. Or the religion of classical liberalism. You have to, you know, if, if, you, if the sexual revolution, if, if sexual pleasure is at the center of your worldview, if that's the guiding principle of your life, you better be attractive. <laughs> you better be engaging. You better be able to go out and get people to have sex with you. Because if you can't, you're kicked out. If the American dream is your guiding principle, you better be financially successful. If you're not, your world is crushed. The American dream insists you have to do this. You have to make money. You have to be upwardly mobile. You have to be owning your own home or on the path to owning your own home. And if, if something tears that apart, you know, if you, if you get sick and you lose your house, or if the job that you devoted yourself to, you majored in it in college and you've kind of climbed the ladder and now you found that that job is obsolete. My wife is a, was a print journalist for two decades and that's the industry that she found herself in. People don't read newspapers anymore. The American dream will chew you up and spit you out. You have to meet its demands or you are not successful. Christianity is exactly the opposite. So I would say to this guy, Christianity is offering you the chance to be connected with God to be attractive to the eternal God, to be loved and accepted based upon what he has done, not on anything that you've done. I'm hesitant to complicate this, but I think we have to add another layer here. Go for it. And I hope uh, this isn't a curveball. 
But so far we've talked about religions and uh, teachings, religious teachings that separate Christianity from Islam yeah. and Islam from Buddhism and all the rest in a temporal way, the right and wrong way to behave in this life. What happens when we add the religious claims or teaching claims of all the religions about afterlife so that when you do what you do in this life, it not only affects the way things happen here, but it has a, some kind of an impact after you die. Does that make the question, is Christianity or religion harder or easier? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it changes it. It changes it materially. Christianity, well, I'll say this. Christianity, unlike these other religions, has an end point that's already started. That's the best way I can say it. Um, what I mean is this: you know, in Hinduism, you know, you're going after moksha, the, the final absorption of your soul into Brahman, into the universe. In, in Buddhism, you're chasing after nirvana. That's out there in the future. You have not yet achieved nirvana. You, if you do your dharma and you meditate, you can achieve nirvana. The American dream. You know, you can make up your own endpoint there. It's it's a it's a it's a future goal for all of us. Is that you know I need to um, work hard enough to make enough money so that you know I can buy that condo on Sanibel, so I can go down there during the winter and play golf. Why, well, whatever it is, you know that's 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 the end point. That's the goal of all this. You know, and, and all of your life's going to be committed to these things. Christianity. The difference in Christianity and all these other worldviews and religions is this, is that Christianity says the end goal is now upon you. Uh, Paul talks about we upon whom the ends of the earth have come. He also says if any person belongs to Jesus, they are the new creation. That end goal, the thing that we're all chasing after, whatever that is, maybe it's sexual pleasure, maybe it's food pleasure, maybe it's financial security, maybe it's nirvana, maybe it's heaven someday or whatever it is, walking the streets of gold. Christianity insists that those things are not just future realities, but they're current realities that have already been given to us, that what you're actually chasing after is in the now. And that's I, I quoted this in a sermon recently. It's a great C.S. Lewis quote about, and I don't have the words in front of me now, so I'm going to be kind of making it up a little bit. In Christianity of all religions, in the future, when Christians believe that they are in the new creation, with a perfect relationship with God and with each other and taking care of the environment, they will look back on their present lives now in the here and now, and they will say, oh, I was already a part of that. The new creation was already upon me. I was already experiencing the success that I had been hoping for. I was already experiencing the fulfillment that you know the sexual revolution or Hinduism or Islam or uh, individualism was offering me. But I thought, I've got to do some things to get to it in the future. It's already been given to me here in the here and now. Now, there, there is future elements of it. Uh, we become more and more aware of it. Uh, the Bible insists that there's coming a day when Jesus is going to uh, come back and make all things new, to fix everything, to right all the wrongs. But right now, it's been, we don't have to do anything to achieve it. It's, that, that would be what all the religions and worldviews say, is that you have to do something to get to that point. Christianity insists it's already been given to you in the here and now. I don't know if that answers the question. or. Well, I'm struggling a little bit with what I think is a decidedly abstract discussion. I don't know how to make this black and white, right? and I'm pretty sure it really can't be made black and white or one-dimensional. It's three-dimensional, and so we'll always struggle with it. Let's circle back around to the question, is it correct to categorize Christianity as a religion? Is Christianity a religion? If somebody asked me that question and I were to say yes and no, would you agree with that answer? Yeah. I thought you might. So give me the no part of is Christi Christianity a religion, the, the no answer to that question. The no answer to it has to do with the grace that I was talking about. Our God in Christianity sacrifices himself to bring us into his 
family, new creation, however you want to say it. In all of the religions, you are required to sacrifice yourself. This is the major difference. It's the difference between uh, you know, what a lot of theologians call law and gospel or works and grace. Um, Christianity, in this sense, is not a religion like those. It's not something that's based upon what we do. You, you can't You'll never, you know, it's the, the great uh, uh, Rockefeller line, right? How much money is uh, enough? And his answer was, uh, very self-reflectively, his answer was one more dollar. Because he knows there's not enough work he can do to actually satisfy the American dream God. Christianity says God's already done all the work to bring you into the reality of what this is all about. And that's the major difference. That's the, that's the big no. Christianity, in that sense, is not a religion. Okay. So same question. Is it correct to categorize Christianity as a religion? What's the yes answer to that? The yes is, is that Christians go to church. Christians want to not steal. Christians want to not murder. Like, like all the religions, these, these ethical behaviors are, in, in many cases, identical. There's small differences in the ethical demands of the different religions. And certainly, once you get into the the postmodern Western secular religions like the sexual revolution, some of the demands are radically different. Some of the ethical demands, but th- but there still is ethical demands that we all sort of subscribe to. And in that sense, you, you know, Muslims go to go to mosque, Jews go to synagogue, Hindus go to temple, uh, Christians go to church. In that sense, it looks very very similar. And, and you can call Christianity a religion in that sense. There certainly is outward physical content to the Christian life. If the inward reality of knowing God is there, then loving our neighbors, loving the environment, wanting to worship God. But but what, what's the priority? That's the question. Like, do you do the ethical behavior to get in, to make the God happy, or because the God's already happy with you, now you can do the ethical ethical behavior? And I used to sit, tell my. Uh, I remember I have one of my children who. Uh, uh, definitely uh, was and has been and will be for the foreseeable future a challenged child when it comes to uh, you know raising them and even living in the same house with them sometime. I, and I and I love them for it. But I used to say to this child, I used to I, I used to say, um, I, I want you to obey me, but I still love you. I want you to obey me, but I still love you. And I stopped saying that because I realized the message I was sending was is in some sense. Your obedience has put my love for you in question, and I just want to reaffirm it. And so I started saying, I want you to obey me because I love you. And that's, the, that's what I want my kids to do. I want them to know that they're safe with me, that they belong to me, and that their obedience is because they just love their dad. And that's what Christianity is about. We obey God because he loves us, unlike all the other religions where you have to obey God so that he will love you. The obedience is going to look the same, right? I mean, you know, t- taking care of uh, your friends and your family, uh, being honest at work. This is going to, look, but the the motives are completely different. So it sounds to me that you have separated Christianity from the pack and set it aside on its own. No other religion occupies this same category as you have described it. If in doing that you have offended somebody. If in doing that, you seem to be saying that your religion, your faith, the way you view it is superior to all others and they're offended, how do you respond? Well, I guess I wouldn't be sitting here talking into this microphone if I didn't think that you and I had something to offer that was of value. I, you know, if, if somebody's offended by the notion that Christianity is different and offers some, something better— Get a hold of me. We could talk about it. I, I, I certainly don't mean to offend, and I don't think the content of what we've said is offensive. I, what I'm, what I've done is offered. You know, I don't think you know if, if, if my, if somebody says to me, "Hey, you allowing your son to live in your house even though he disobeys you, and you still feed him meals and give him food, and you take him to the cardinal game sometime, and uh, you know you take him out for frozen custard." That's really offensive to me that you would be that kind and generous with him. You know, I think the best thing for him to do is try to force you to be his father by meeting all your ethical demands. I, I would just say that you're, if, if, you know, if this is offensive, that 
um, you've misunderstood what I'm saying. I'm what I'm what I'm saying is that God offers us free, infinite relationship with Him, free acceptance by Him, infinite attraction He has for us, and He's willing to put all the cash into the game to make it happen. Now, you. You can, you can completely say, I think that that's wrong and I disagree with you, and I will understand that. I don't understand how that could be offensive, you know, the free gift of God's love for me. It could be wrong. Maybe we're completely wrong with this. I, it's not well, offensive, though. Um, trying to walk in that person's shoes, perhaps, I can see where it might be offensive because I may have spent a large part, if not all of my life, long life, working so hard to appease the Christian God right, and feeling pretty good about it. And then I listen to this podcast, and I think I hear you saying that all of that hard work that I've invested hasn't really moved the needle at all as far as appeasing God or yeah. earning his favor. I could see where somebody might be put off by that. Right. Oh, yeah, so now you bring Christians into it. The, the person you're describing is somebody who's been trying to appease the Christian God. And uh, you've opened up the possibility, well, you did, and it's part of human condition, right, that Christians themselves who are members of the belief system that I'm describing here, a God who graciously gives himself, might actually be religious in this negative sense that we're talking about, trying to get this God. And I would just say, look, you're already in the house. I, I, you know, you should be relieved. You, you know, the work that you're doing to try and stay in the house has infinite value. But not because you're earning the father of the house's favor, but because you already have the father of the house's favor. If you're a Christian and you've been trying to make God happy, all I can say is that look up. He's already happy with you. Keep doing what you're doing, but not because you want to make him happy, but because he's already happy with you. And this is one of the great things about Christianity is that, well, you know, what I'm not saying is, is that um, all the things that you know what I'm not saying is that all the all the good things that you can do don't matter. Like not murdering somebody, it doesn't matter. Um, you, even even the secular uh, religions that making money doesn't matter because it's just attempts to get God to like you, or you know, not having sex with people you want to have sex with doesn't matter because it's no. What Christianity says is that all that stuff matters and has value. Being honest has value. Having sex has value. Eating food has value. Making money has value. Buying that condo in Sanibel, if that's something that's appropriate for you in your place in life and in your relationship with God, that has value, but not because it's going to make any sort of God or world system happy with you because you already have that. God's already given you his pleasure. The term religion pops up a couple of times in the New Testament. One of them is in the first chapter of James, yeah. where James says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Here it comes, yes. a straight definition right out of the Word yeah. of God. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. If I were to say, well, sure, and a Muslim could say that, yes, and a person who, is, who follows Judaism could say that or any of the other religions, is there a distinction here that I'm missing or has James just become inclusive? Well, I mean, so you got to read James in the whole entirety of the rest of scripture, right? You know, um, uh, circumcise your hearts, Isaiah and uh, uh, Moses and Deuteronomy say, rend your hearts and not your garments. You know, d d d internally is what I'm after. You know, Jesus says, he's quoting Isaiah too, he says, um, uh, their lips honor me, but their hearts are far from me. Now, Jesus is not saying, you know, don't honor me with your lips. Don't do the outward observance. He's just going after the internal. And James is doing the same thing. You can totally talk about religion in the sense of visiting orphans and widows and keeping oneself unstained by the world. That's a part of, that's a part of Christian religion. It's a part of, of a lot of religions to take care of the needy. The difference here, though, is in James 1.27, is that it's religion in the sight of our God and Father. <laughs> you know, it's not religion to appease God. He is your Father. You know, he already, you're his child, he already loves you, and you belong to him, and because of that, you are completely liberated to go out there and take care of other people with the freedom of knowing, I'm not earning anybody's pleasure, I'm not, I don't have to satisfy anybody with this, I already have the satisfaction of God. 
One more quick question. Is it possible? I think you may have, I think you touched on this. Is it possible to be too religious for Christians? Uh, well, it depends upon what you mean by religion, right? So usually when we say too religious, well, I don't know what people usually mean, but too religious can mean focus so much on doing the outward things, doing the, you know, keeping the commandments and not being concerned or to do, to do, do those outward things because you are concerned that you have to earn God's favor. In that sense, too religious might be the wrong phrase. It's the wrong religion at that point. You're not, you're not uh, observing biblical Christianity. You're trying to earn favor that you already have. So is it possible to be too religious? No, probably not. If we understand religion to be the way we live our lives based on the free relationship and love and grace that we have in God through Jesus Christ. Is this the distinction between piety and pietism? Oh, piety and piety. I guess so. That's the same thing though. You can, uh, uh, you, you can, you know, play semantics all you want, but typically in some of the circles that maybe not all of our listeners, but you and I are familiar with Chuck, that is a, di- that, that is a distinction that's frequently made. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about that sometime down the road. Yeah, that could be fun. All right. Thank you for listening to our Craving Answers, Craving God podcast with Pastor Aaron Miller, pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. If you have a topic or a question for Pastor Miller, we encourage you to go to our website at stjamesglencarbon.org and click Contact Us. You'll be able to leave a message there. Thank you for listening.